Well, it was a busy week this week, as you can see uh, from the children singing to everything that was happening around here, that our Vacation Bible School was a huge success. Uh, what you saw up here a few minutes ago is about half the kids, or only about half, less, maybe less than half the kids that were here, and uh, they had a great time. I know Olivia is exhausted, and uh, many of you are from the hours that you put in here. Thank you again, Jada, for this beautiful backdrop. This is wonderful, so thank you for doing that. And uh, it was great to see the kids learning about the armor of God. And one of the pieces of the armor of God is prayer, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. But as I said earlier, we have reached our final week of our series in James, our final installment. I hope you've enjoyed this series. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been inspired uh, in our uh, along our journey through this short book. Only five chapters is pretty short in comparison. Uh, we've learned a lot from the half-brother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We've learned all kinds of things. Let me do a brief review. In week one, we learned about testing and persevering. In week two, we learned about listening and doing. In week three, we learned about the theme of the entire book, which is faith and works. Last week, we learned about how our words matter and about speaking and, and about speaking and not boasting. Or speaking and boasting and what James was saying about that. Today, this final installment, we're going to learn about waiting and praying. And as uh, Renee rightfully said, it's always praying and waiting. Praying and waiting. It's not waiting first and praying, but that's the way James puts it. That we need to wait on the Lord as we pray. The story is told of a man who was charged with stealing a turkey. This is maybe a make-believe story, but nevertheless, I think it makes the, makes the point. His defense before the judge was that it was an answer to prayer. The judge asked the man to explain what did he mean by that stealing a turkey was an answer to prayer. The man said, well, sir, the night before Thanksgiving, I had no turkey, so I prayed that the Lord would give me one. Well, Thanksgiving evening came, and I still had no turkey, so I changed my prayer to, Lord, send me to get a turkey, and the Lord answered, and so I did. Obviously, that's poor theology, and I'm sure that you know that that is not what today's message is going to be about. But this story does illustrate that what some people think when they hear the words, waiting and praying together. How long do we wait? Well, we only wait a short window of time before we start acting. Most of the time, the Lord wants us to be active in our waiting and active in our praying. But sometimes, He wants us to look for the other opportunities and the other options that He might be leading us to during our praying and waiting in that process. James wrote from an impassionate position. I shared with you before that he was a leader of a congregation that had their problems. We talked about that a little bit before, and we see that his whole letter is sprinkled with pretty strong exhortations, almost harsh ex exhortations, to this congregation. But he was a good pastor. He cared for his people, and through his letter, he was sharing on and on and on about how that he had practical advice for them. He, he shared godly wisdom, a care and concern and compassion for his people. And if James was here today, I'm sure that he would want us to hear those same things. Today, as we look more about what he has to say about waiting and praying in this section, this final section, I want us to remember the context in which he was writing. Because New Testament letters are never written in a vacuum. They're already, always written in a historical context. So never forget that he was writing to a people that had some problems. This was not a perfect church. You're going to hear more about that today when he talks about grumbling and complaining against one another. But he also has some great advice to them. And as they were facing persecution, and, he, and remember that's one of the key contexts in this, in this whole letter, is that this church was facing not only current pro, uh, persecution, but upcoming persecution from their government and from others that are outside the church. I can imagine that as they faced those 
persecutions, it sounded pretty strange, and it would to you, too, if you were facing persecution, to be told, just wait on God. He will take care of you. Or be patient and pray, and God will provide everything you need. Now, that sounds like godly advice, but if you're in the midst of a persecution or if you're in the midst of trouble, that sounds pretty pious, doesn't it? Just wait on God, especially if it's said in that tone. For many of us, we're quick to try to figure out whatever's going on in our life, whatever problem we're going through. We're quick to try to figure out how we can solve our problems um, on our own. And by the way, that's not always totally wrong. God does give us a mind. He does give us the ability to think for ourselves. And sometimes we need to do that. In fact, it's in our nature. It's in the very human nature to try to solve our problems. It's also in our culture. Our culture is quick to figure out how we can solve problems. By the way, you know that we live in a culture where we don't really want need to wait on anything. We can order anything we possibly want or need and have it delivered to our homes in two days or less, right? So why wait? Why do we need to pray? Why do we need to pray earnestly that God would do the miraculous on our behalf in the midst of our problems when we can just click a few clicks on the mouse and get what we need? Today, we live in that culture that to wait on anyone or wait on anything is almost a foreign language. It's a foreign concept. Wait? What do you mean wait? We have instant coffee. We have microwaves. We have two-day delivery. We have all kinds of things that are instant, quick, and fast. We live in a culture that is all about uh, making things uh, exponential, you know, and just happen right away about, about, you know, getting things right, done right uh, in, a, in a quick season of time. Seldom do we ever think that, or at least in my experience, seldom do I ever feel that the Lord is late in his answer to our prayers. But what I've also found is his timing is never my timing. You know, I want the Lord to answer my prayers like now. Like, right as I say the amen. But the Lord's timing is seldom my timing. He often is doing something during my waiting. Can you imagine facing persecution? Life and death persecution. Can you imagine that? That's what these people were going through that he was writing to. I know that we don't face life and death persecution here in our country currently, but they do around the world. Christians do around the world right now today. But I can guarantee us all, the longer that we follow Jesus, the more opportunities that we're going to learn the value of waiting and praying for the Lord to do his work. By the way, that's where the Lord does his best work, in our waiting and our praying. It's the most pivotal pivotal in our lives. It shows us that We cannot do everything, solve our own problems as we think we can. We need him. We need him to interject his will and his power into our lives. He also shows us that in our waiting that he's inspiring us to trust him more. And it builds our confidence in him when he answers our prayer and our waiting and our praying. Just like Renee had to wait for her husband, in her senior year of college. By the way, that was a joke. And none of you laughed except her. She prayed for her husband. She wanted a husband, and she got to her senior year. She had no boyfriend, and then I came along. Right? Problem solved. (laughs) Or problems just began. (laughs) For those of us who have trusted Christ, Patience and prayer are two of the most powerful forces in our lives. We have to get away from our, our cultural norms, which is we ask, we get, we want, we click, and it's there quick, fast, and in a hurry. We have to get away from that. 
God's timing doesn't always work that way. Most often, it doesn't work that way. And when it does, it's the abnormal, not the normal. I know there are stories that you probably all have that you prayed, and instantly, God answered your prayer. But that's not his normal mode. He grows us in our faith and confidence in him in our waiting and our praying. So please open your Bibles to James chapter 5, verse 7. That's where we're going to begin today, and let's go to the Lord. Father, I thank you that you do grow us in our waiting and our praying, that you don't grow us in our confidence in you when you answer our prayers right away. You do your best work in our lives. You do your best work in gaining confidence in you by waiting on you, by trusting you. So, Lord, we repent of the times that we thought that we didn't have the time to pray or that prayer was too trivial or prayer was too simple, too simple of an answer for our problems. So, Father, increase our faith. Expand our understanding of the power of prayer and the righteous act of waiting on you and your perfect timing. And Father, we pray that you'll speak to us this morning from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. James began his fifth chapter with some pretty strong words of encouragement or exhortation to the wealthy within the congregation. We're not going to look at those few verses, those six verses. But then he, in verse 7, he jumps into this whole series of waiting and praying, and praying and waiting. And he's going to give exhortation, he's going to give encouragement, he's going to give examples for us that are practical and make sense. So let's talk about this active, being actively waiting. Waiting is not passive. The waiting of the Lord should be active in our, on, our, on our part. We don't sit around and wait for the Lord, twiddle our thumbs. Look what James says in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Esta uh, establish, or the extra word means to be strengthened, strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Seven times in these verses, James makes something, he says something about patience, about waiting, about being steadfast. What a powerful encouragement to followers of Jesus, whether in the first century or the 21st century, right? We need to hear that. We need to be reminded that it is God at work in us that we need to wait and be patient on him, to be steadfast. By the way, patience is one of the eight fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And patience is one of the key characteristics of any follower of Jesus. Most people who follow Jesus aren't known as being impatient people. Let me say that again. Most people who follow Jesus aren't known for being impatient people. That's a condemnation on myself, and maybe it's a condemnation on more, more of you. That often we think that God is at our beck and call. The reason I played that video at the beginning was the same reason that it's just a reminder that often we think when we go to prayer that God, we got God on the phone, and he's got to listen to us. We're his child, we're going to ask him, and he's going to deliver now. That sounds an awful like, like a spoiled child. And often, 
myself and maybe some of you, we not even realizing it, we act like that spoiled child. God, you're listening, right? You love me, right? Answer my prayer now or I'll throw a fit. Often that's my attitude, maybe yours as well. Twice in this verse, in these verses, James says something about the coming of the Lord. There are several things that stand out in what James was talking about here in these verses. Patience, by the way, is first and foremost in this passage. Patience, waiting, is the key in all this, all, all that he says in these verses. But there's also the object of why are we waiting? Why are we being patient? Why? Because the coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord was one of the key objects, the key preaching texts of all the New Testament. Everyone in the first century in that early church expected the Lord to come in their lifetime. And yet he didn't. But we need to have that same kind of earnest expectation that the Lord could come in our lifetime. Can you imagine what it would be like if I was throwing a temper tantrum about God not answering my prayer and he comes back? Ooh, that would be a little embarrassing for me, wouldn't it? And yet that idea of the Lord coming back or could come back at any moment was in the forefront of every mind of every Christian in that first century. The return of the Lord was front and center to the early church. You see that in almost every letter in the New Testament. The writer talks about that. It can't be understated about the belief that Jesus can return at any point, that we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to patiently wait for his perfect timing, not ours, was on the mind of every one of those early, early Christians. It should be that same way in ours as well. For as much as James talked about words and works in this book, I think he also emphasized throughout the book about being patient on the Lord, being waiting for the Lord, by praying for the Lord. Prayer is one of the key aspects of this whole book. And the decision to pray and wait, actively wait, are powerful decisions for any church. I appreciate that Kurt did that time of prayer this morning, that you joined up with someone else and prayed. So often, even in our church services, prayer is done as almost expected. We're going to pray now, pray 30 seconds later, we're done, now we're moving on. And yet we need to be intentionally about our prayer that we are waiting for the Lord. Notice what he says here in verses 7. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until, he re until it receives the early and late rains. And, and then he goes on to say, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord and how they remain steadfast. Anyone who knows the story of the Old Testament prophets know how they were not received. They were not welcomed. They were not gladly embraced for what they said and how they said it. But they remained steadfast in that time. He said, look to those Old Testament prophets which provided practical examples of what it mean, meant to pray and wait. All those Old Testament prophets, yes, they spoke in behalf of the Lord. They spoke forth for the Lord. They, they for, spoke forehand or before, so things that were going to happen. I didn't say that quite right. But they spoke so that the Lord could get his uh, will and his plan before the people. But when, he, when they did... They obviously not only did the, the preaching or the proclaiming, but they waited and prayed for the Lord to answer those prayers. Then he went on to give the ultimate example of patience to encourage the church about remembering the story of Job, which if you're familiar with that story, you know that Job, at the very beginning of that book, he loses everything. He loses his children. He loses 
all his possessions. He loses everything that he has. He loses his fortune. He ends up losing friends. This man was an in, in, uh, he was an instrumental and influential person in the community. And when all this tragedy falls on him, everybody in the community shuns him. Even those that call themselves his friend accuse Job of sin in his life, which were, was totally untrue. And if you know the story, you know it's untrue. But if you also know what Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, you know at the end, because of Job's steadfastness, his patiently waiting on the Lord, he receives an incredible reward in the end. I think we can all, all can agree that and, and just greatly esteem people like Job and others that we see in our own lives who pray over and over and over again. They patiently wait on the Lord, and then the Lord re rewards them in one way or the other. And we esteem them as godly. We say, that's the way it should be. But in our lives, there's a gap. Because that's good for somebody else. But I want to pray, and God answer my prayer now. Most of us know the biblical story of Joseph, Joseph in the Old Testament, not Joseph in the New Testament. Joseph in the Old Testament, if you know the story, you know that God gives jo uh, Joseph a dream. Actually, he gives him two dreams, that his brother will bow, brothers will bow down before him someday, then, and then even his father will bow down before him someday. And because of that dream, and because he shares that dream with his family, they hate him. They hate him with a passion. They end up throwing him in the pit. They want to kill him, but, oh, no, let's not do that. Let's make a little profit. We'll sell him to those guys that are heading down to Egypt far, far away from our town. Let's get rid of him. Let's make a little cash on, on the side. And so they do. And if you know the story, Joseph gets down to Egypt, and while he's there, God blesses him. But he's falsely accused of something that he doesn't do. He's thrown into prison. While he's in prison, once again, he, God blesses him and gives him the ability to help two guys. And then he's forgotten even in prison. But in the end, if you know the story of Joseph, you know that God never abandons Joseph. God is there with him. And if you know the story, if you've ever read the story from Genesis, you know that no, there is no hint of Joseph ever being impatient on the Lord. I'm sure that if he's like most of us, which I believe he was, that he had to have times in his life to wonder, all right, God, it's not this time, then when is your time? I'm sure he had those thoughts. But nowhere do we read that he became impatient or grumbled or complained against the Lord. And the Lord eventually delivered him to second in command of all of Egypt. And so he's rewarded. We count people that demonstrate that kind of patient waiting and prayer life as fortunate or blessed or strong in their faith because of their willingness to be patient and endure suffering and be steadfast along the way. Waiting isn't, isn't easy for any of us. In our fast-paced, immediate gratification world that we live in, I suspect that waiting is almost a foreign language. It's a foreign concept to most of us, right? Why wait? I can fix most of my problems with a few clicks of the mouse. Why wait? There's 60 days, same as cash financing. There's YouTube. There's instant coffee. There's microwaves. Why wait? There's a drive through just around the corner. Can you imagine people that lived 200 years ago with what we have today? I mean, it just absolutely blows our mind how fast we get things today. We built our entire culture on efficiency and precision and productivity. And amazingly, we are no closer to peacefulness, contentment, or satisfaction than Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. We've not changed in all these centuries. But God's word has some of the most powerful encouragement for those of us who remain steadfast 
in our prayer, in our waiting of the Lord, in our confidence. Listen to some of these verses. Isaiah, verse, Isaiah chapter 40. Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord, there's the key, shall renew their strength, shall mount up with, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That was the verse at the end of the video at the beginning. Psalm 27. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait on the Lord. Why do you think it said that twice? Because even people in the time of David in Psalm 27, they were impatient like us. And so he says it at the beginning, and he also says it at the end. 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Waiting isn't passive. Waiting is powerful. And as we wait on the Lord, as we adopt this posture of being patient, it gives us a renewed strength. It gives us a renewed confidence that God is still at work in our lives even if we don't see it, even if we don't feel it. It's not detrimental to wait on the Lord. To all those who profess as followers of Jesus, it gives us an incredible confidence and it demonstrates that we trust our Savior who knows us, who knows our circumstance, and cares for us incredibly more than we could ever ask or think. There's some of us, there's some other things that we do in the midst of our waiting that make it even more powerful. And that is, I would say, it almost supercharges our waiting. James told his congregation, don't grumble, don't complain against one another. Don't swear by heaven or earth or any other thing. And finally, he says, be prayerful. Here's what happens. Here's what happens in my life. I don't know if it happens in your life. When I pray, when I'm, in a, when I'm in a situation that is troublesome or difficult and I begin praying and God doesn't answer my prayer right away, I become grumbling. I grumble. It's almost like being hangry. You know, hangry is when you're hungry and angry at the same time. When God doesn't answer our prayer, answer my prayer as soon as I think he should or as in my timing, I become impatient with the Lord. I become almost grumbling. I, I become grumble, a grumbler and a complainer. You're rolling your eyes at me. I know it's true. Okay. Here you thought your pastor was perfect. Ha uh ha. -huh. No, no one thinks that. Our patiently waiting on the Lord should not drive us to, cr uh, to grumble and complain against the Lord or against one another. Which brings us to point number two, which is earnestly praying. In verse 13, James said these words. Is anyone among, among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will rise raise him up and he will he who excuse me if he has committed sin he will be forgiven let me do a little explanation of these verses because these verses have caused some denominations some church groups to spin off in a wildly and what i believe is a wildly different direction than what the text actually says we at grace evangelical church believe that god has inspired his word in the original manuscripts so let me do a little explain, explaining here. Prayer is the most significant ministry in the life and action of the elders of the church. It is not what we do. It's not what we say. Prayer is the most active and the most important, influential element of the elders of any church. And it should also be the same is true in the life of any Christian, any follower of Jesus. Prayer should be the most, in, most important part of, of our life, our walk with Jesus. By the way, 
prayer in this passage is the main verb in all these, in this entire text. The entire text that I just read, the key verb, the key action in this entire text, in the original language, is pray. Then the supporting participle is anointing. So anointing isn't the key element. Prayer is the key element. Also, anointing is not only a secondary action, but if James really had in mind that this is ceremonial anointing, like anointing like they did the Old Testament pri uh, priests or the Old, Old Testament kings, if he really wanted to use that word as ceremonial, there is a word in the Greek language to mean that. The word that he used here is basically apply oil as medicinal. And back then, in that first century, oil was a major medical uh, tool that doctors would use as a salve or as, an, as a, as a uh, medicine to help people heal. James could have used the other word, but he chose not to. He could have used the word for ceremonial anointing, but that's not he, what he used. James gave two reasons for prayer here in this passage. The first one is, if you're in trouble. How many have done that? How many of us have done that? We're in trouble, we pray. We should, that should be the first thing. Sometimes we call it a flare prayer. If you're in trouble, if you're lost, you shoot a flare in the air so people can find you. Sometimes we get in trouble, we shoot a flare prayer up. God, help me. I'm in trouble. And it's quick, fast, and in a hurry. And we expect God to do something. Hey, remember, I'm here. I'm your child. I'm in trouble. You know, intercede. Get involved in my situation. But that's not really what James is talking about here. He is being serious about this. If you're in trouble, if you have a need, pray. It is okay to do that. There are some people who think, well, God's got so many people to take care of. I can take care of my own problem. I don't need to pray. My problem's too little. I had, I had a guy tell me one time, you know, I went to church, not our church, but he went to a church. He says, I went to church, and the pastor said that if I lose my keys, I can pray. Is that true? I said, Absolutely. Have you never done that before? And then suddenly it's like, oh, there they are. God leads you right to them. We can pray for any little thing or any big thing in our life. God is never bothered by our prayers. He cares about everything that goes on in our life. Whether they're big or whether they're small, God wants us to talk to him. That's what fellowship with the Lord is all about. That he cares for us. He wants to talk to us. But the second reason that James says that we, to pray, we are to pray is if someone is sick. That is in this passage. It is okay to pray for someone who's sick or has a physical ailment. It's in the passage. And so often we think, we'll let the doctors take care of that. Or we'll let the hospital take care of that. And that, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, that approach. God has given doctors and hospitals a unique ability to know the human body and research what ails us. Most of the time, they do a good job, but it is called practicing medicine for a reason. Again, I'm not, I'm not downplaying medical, the medical field. I'm not. But often we think the, the doctors will take care of that when James says the very first thing we need to do is pray, when someone is sick, yes, take them to the doctor, take them to the hospital, but pray as you do that. And then continue to pray for them. Which begs the question, shouldn't prayer be our default response? Why is it always the second response? Shouldn't prayer be the habitual response response for each and every one of our situations that we find ourselves in? Shouldn't it be the normal go-to every time, the first time, every time when we're in a difficult situation or when someone is sick? I know it sounds crazy, 
But everywhere in the Bible, if I were to ask any person in the Bible, shouldn't prayer be our number one go-to? What do you think the people in the Bible would say? Yes. Not only yes, but it is actually the will of God for our lives. The Apostle Paul said these words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. For those of us who follow Jesus, that call ourselves Christians, it is the will of God that we pray at all times. Church, I believe the will of God is that we always rejoice, we always pray, that we always give thanks in all circumstances. And I know it sounds impossible. I know for us, even in, in, in our day and time, those words almost sound like you have no clue what you're thinking or saying. Because I can't find five minutes to even sit down in quietness. How am I going to have five minutes to pray? How am I going to have any time to do this? How can I find five minutes to pray or rejoice or even sit down and open my Bible? I've got kids. I've got activities. I've got things that I've got to do. There's so many to-do things on my list. How would I ever find a little bit of time to go to God? But for a minute, let's set that impossible thing away from our mind. Let's just push it aside and say, you know what? It is possible because God says it's important. Notice what James says here. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Those could not be more true words in the first century than today. Those things we have to take hold of and say, yeah, it sounds impossible, but if it's in God's word, then it is possible. It is important. It's not secondary. It's first and foremost in our lives. And then James, just to make it even more real, he gives a real-life example from the book of um, kings found in Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Let that set in for just a second. Often we put those Old Testament prophets up on a pedestal and we say, we could never be like one of those guys. And yet here James says, he has the nature just like you and me. He's no different. He was a human being just like you and me. He wasn't super in any way, shape, or form. He was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. The prayers of a righteous person, James says, is powerful. It is unbelievable to have someone you, you respect, someone that you know has walked with the Lord and demonstrated that they walk with the Lord, say to you, I'm praying for you. Now, if there's some heathen that says that, then you kind of shuck it off and say, yeah, thanks. But if it's someone that you have a high esteem for and you've watched them and you know their walk with the Lord and they say, I'm praying for you, you know that prayer is going to be answered, Right? Singing songs of praise in the midst of suffering is also powerful. As we learned last week from what James says, our words and our actions do matter. And in God's kingdom economy, they carry immeasurable weight. You can't forget that. Prayers are always said with words. Remember we talked about words last week? Prayers have to use words to get the, the point across. So we can assume that prayers that are from a righteous person are supercharged and that our waiting is maximized as we patiently wait on God's perfect timing. Whether we're in trouble, whether we're happy, whether we're sad, whether we're sick, we need to make the habit of prayer and trust 
with every word that is spoken, every word that's offered to the Lord, because it carries incredible power to affect change in our lives, in our situation, in our circumstances. If you know the story of Elijah, this is the attitude that he had. When he prayed again and again that God would answer his prayers. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 18. And Elijah said to Ahab, by the way, let me just do a quick review. Ahab was a Jew. Ahab knew the Lord God. Jezebel, his wife, was, I can use the word heathen. She was a foreigner. She didn't respect and she didn't trust in the Lord God. But Ahab, Ahab was just off the rail. Ahab was the king. Elijah was the prophet. And Elijah said to King Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of a rushing rain. There's faith. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. Ahab did exactly what Elijah said. He had the confidence that Elijah was a righteous man and that his prayers would be answered. And Ahab did exactly what this prophet said. And Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down to the earth, and he put his face between his knees, and he, that's God, said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked, and that's, that's Elijah. Elijah went up and he looked and he said, there's nothing. And then God said, go again. Seven times Elijah did this. Seven times. And at the seventh time, Elijah said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he, God, said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down and let, lest the rain stop you. By the way, if you understand what he's saying is, it was going to rain so much that the ground was going to be muddy and his chariot wheels were going to get stuck. That's what he's saying. And, the, and in a little while, while the heavens grew black with the clouds and wind, there was a great rain. And Ahab rode, that's rode in his chariot, and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. By the way, Old Testament prophets were in good physical shape because he could outrun a chariot. All right. Isn't that an incredible story? To me, that illustrates in the, not only the understanding that James had of the Old Testament stories, but how that it reinforced the prayer of a righteous person could change the circumstance in the entire country. They had, been, they had been in a drought for three and a half years. Ahab and Jeze uh, Jezebel were so frustrated, so angry with God, and so angry with a uh, Elijah that they wanted to kill him. But then Elijah prayed, and he told Ahab, God's going to answer. And Ahab, even though he was unrighteous, he believed in the power of the Lord God. The book of James says, Elijah was a man with a nature like us, and he prayed fervently. Obviously, we know that Elijah was one of God's chosen Old Testament prophets. But James uses him as an example to remind us that he was just like you and me, and he was righteous. He was still human. The extraordinary thing that he did was he prayed fervently, and he waited earnestly and believed in God. That is what James is talking about in this passage. Prayer matters. And when you add fervent prayer to the mouth of the righteous, you supercharge the season of waiting. So waiting and praying always are twins. They always go together. So I bring this uh, time of a James, the study of James to a conclusion. I want to reiterate the, the, the fact that James cared and he was concerned for his church. And though there was some her harsh language there in a few places, he really cared about them. Usually when you talk to someone, when someone gives a speech, the very first thing they say and the very last thing they say are the most important. He ends this letter to his church 
with prayer and waiting. It must be important to him. I believe that he shared, if he was here today, he would share that same compassion with you and me. That we can trust him. That God still has the same passion, the same concern, the same care for us. He still wants us to pray earnestly. He still wants us to wait with expectation that he will answer our prayers in his perfect timing. The enemy of our souls, though, he's still seeking to steal, to kill, and destroy. He is the one that wants things immediate. That's what caused him to rebel against God and take uh, one-third of the angels with him. But in the midst of our present darkness, in the midst of the chaos that we have in our world, there shines an ever-present light of Jesus. We need to never miss that. We never should forget that. That God is still at work in our lives and in our circumstances. That we can trust him. His glory, his power, his majesty will never fade, regardless of what the circumstances look like. And someday, maybe even in our lifetime, he'll return. He'll return for us and then he'll return for his church. So we need to pray. We need to take heart to be encouraged to follow what the advice of this pastor, the Lord's half-brother, had to say to an early church. That we need to persevere in the testing. We need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. That we need to know that our faith and our works go hand in hand. That our mouths and our words have to be filled with praise rather than the other. And that what marks us as a follower of Jesus is a deep commitment to prayer and patiently waiting for God to do his work. Over the next few weeks, I want to ask you to do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. I want you to take one or two of these big ideas that we've talked about throughout this series and ask God to expand those in your own life. Hopefully, God has spoken to you through this series. We've covered two to three key elements in each each week. Take one or two of those things and just, God, expand this in my life. Help me to do better in those areas. God doesn't expect perfection, but he does expect growth. And what happens is we sometimes get discouraged because we don't grow as fast as we think. And yet God says, you making progress? You making progress? Just keep making progress. Keep making progress. By the way, one of the things that we can all do is become prayer warriors for our one. Who's the one person that God has laid on our heart to invite to church or share Jesus with or share something about what you've learned in the series. Be thinking and praying for your one. And as we do that, we'll give God the praise. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that your word is always powerful. Your word is always a challenge in our lives. If we listen to it, if we hear it, it always challenges us in our walk with you. Thank you for that. Father, I thank you that as we've seen from this pastor, Pastor James, that we need to be people of prayer first, first and foremost in every situation of our lives. Then we need to earnestly and actively wait on your timing. Because you love us and you tell us over and over again that you do. Father, I pray that this is not a foreign concept for those of us who follow and have trusted you. But for someone here that, hearing my voice that may have never trusted you, this is such a t- foreign concept. Father, I pray that they'll help, you to help, help them to trust you as their Savior and Lord. First and foremost. And then begin trusting you with every area of their life. In Jesus' name.